Bye. Short bus debate club. It's a bus. Rolling. I can get on board. <laughs> Hello, I'm Darren Jolly. <laughs> it's time to get this short bus started. So let's roll. And on with the show. We're here for the second half Short Bus Debate Club. This is Brian. Uh, this is Darren. Sorry. I got centers on my mind. Woo! Yeah. So, that reminds me of just a little story. I didn't know what a fidget spinner was. You're a fucking OCD, though. I mean, you right. really now, are. So, now I've got fidget spinners. Yeah. But... Before, so it was like Ethan's ninth birthday, I think. And somebody said that they got him a fidget spinner. And I was like, Darcy, you can't let him have that. Because they've got, I all I heard about was fidget spinner porn. And I was trying to figure out what the fuck I thought, a fidget, you know, whatever. Anyway, it turned out it was just this fucking thing that you went and between your I, finger I, and I thumb. I think that you need to be a little bit more clear on what you mean about <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, I don't think it was. I think that you're confusing fidget spinner with midget spinner, right? That's what I thought it was. Was again, I don't think that's the preferred nomenclature. Right, it. probably not. Although, I'm just gonna say for the OCD comment for whoever you know. For whoever has OCD, OCD isn't something that somebody should get offended about. I, just go back to the. But midget. they probably just go back do. To the midget spinner. It, it, it doesn't matter. Fuck the midget spinner. Fuck the fidget spinner. We're on the second half of gangs now. Um, so obviously gangs, there are a lot of them, if you believe the FBI, and a lot of members. Um, one stat that I read from like 2012 said there were 850,000 known gang members in the United States. That's a lot of fucking gang members. Whether or not that's gone up or down since 2012, I don't know. Um, and based on what you said with regards to the concept of the problem, that nature of being a known gang member, it makes no, any numbers that anybody gives us less reliable. Right. So we right. just got to kind of play a guess game. I mean, yeah. again, if if you and I or and any of our friends were in a gang, it's not like we'd fucking start tatting shit up and fucking... You know, wearing a certain color and fucking throwing signs and with the midget spinners, we having our own dance. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody wants to see that. No, no, probably not. Um, so there are a, a lot, a lot of, of them, gangs, yes. and, and, and gang they've been around for a long time. But obviously, you know, some of them have gotten bigger, faster. Some of them came over here and they were already large and well financed. So when I say bigger, faster, I mean the Italian mob got pretty big pretty fast. Um, now, obviously, they came from Sicily, but the Russian mob came over here and they were already big. I mean, they fucking hit the East Coast with a, a big just fucking smack and pissed off the Italian mob and whatever. Um, if you consider the drug cartels more than just a drug trafficking organization, then, you know, they hit us with a big smack. Um, but then there are lots of these neighborhood gangs, because again, a gang is three or more people with the same <laughs> idea. I just, I just hate that. Like, sometimes I wish that, like... Like you, the 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 constructing of legal categories in, in terms of ambiguity, like so that you can have more latitude to do certain things. Like I, I just want to know. I just want to understand. Of course, I have a totally different set of interests relative to this than the FBI because I tend to like feel for people that have kind of shitty situations. And uh, while I'm not endorsing activities that people engage in i understand why certain things happen at certain times i know that when i was a kid you know my parents got divorced they got separated in 89 my mom was making 13 just under fourteen thousand dollars a year that lent itself to certain uh demands I, I i had two pairs of pants for two years you know i mean so i had to figure out a way to you know 
have clothes. You know, I mean, if that's life, you can say whatever you want. And I, you know, I mean, this is it, obviously it's a poor white kid, you know, in in suburbia, you know, as were you, motherfucker, you know. Dude, I'm not saying that I wasn't. <laughs> no, I, no, I no, mean, no, I was, I wasn't creating that distinction. But I mean, so the the, the point being that. Um, like what we what we are always trying to do is try to understand these things in a more honest and real way, not not to look at somebody and slap a fucking category on them and say, "I think you're this, you're evil, you know, you should go to prison for the rest of your life." I'd rather understand how and why something happened. No, but you know what? They did slap that title on me. The fucking stupid Littleton police, and this is before you moved on the other side of Broadway, okay. when you were still on Pearl. Yeah. They said that I was the gang leader yeah, and I was I taking those girls and fucking them for an initiation into the gang and all that. of this other bullshit. So in, in the in the empty uh, apartments downstairs in your, your right. downtown. Atlanta. And again, so that's that ambiguity thing because there were only a handful of us. I mean, and maybe double that handful if you include the chicks, but. I wasn't banging girls to initiate them in a gang. That sounds like a really bad call. <laughs> no matter what. But, I mean, we're in Littleton. We were in Littleton, right? And Littleton was a very goofy place during that time period. Like, uh, these 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 cops were watching, you know, they watched what happened with, like, Rodney King on fucking, you know, and they, they, they would have, they'd watch too many, they'd watch cops. They'd watch too many, too much fucking TV. And then they'd have these fantasies of like, you know, being like T.J. Hooker or some stupid shit like that. Well, I mean, I there were what, big mouth neighbors and stuff too. That, yeah, that, no, I'm not. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And we were, we were, we partied and we had fun, but we were not, we weren't breaking anybody's cars. You know, we weren't. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of. I mean, there were some things that happened to be sure, but there, it, it wasn't like uh, the Littleton crime wave, right? Down on uh, Pennsylvania and Pearl Street. We were on the lower side. The Hoobie Hitters. Isn't that what Trish used to say? God, we, <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but. Well, no, I was just going to say, so again, um, I think it's important. Well, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. Like we in the first half, we're talking a lot about the cartels or Central America or, you know, whatever, prison gangs in the Southwest. So we kind of talk about what we know. But a lot of these organizations work together, okay? So the Italian mob and the Sinaloa cartel or the Russian mob and the Juarez cartel, and I'm just using those as, as examples. I don't know if they actually work together. But these drugs are coming into the country somehow. And I'm okay with that. That's fine. But what we don't know as much about, and I think it's because they're quieter, is most heroin is made in Southeast Asia. And nobody ever talks about that the heroin being imported or exported so it's from being, there. it's being made where it's, you said Southeast Asia, where, where? So Myanmar is generally, but they have this place called the Golden Triangle, and it's between basically on one border is China, Thailand is another border, but it's basically, it's Burma. So that's, that's really more South. I mean, Southeast is... Oh, sorry. But no, if you want to talk about fucking designations all the time, I mean, South Korea is a long fucking ways away from where you're talking about right there. Japan is, is a long ways away from there. Melanesia, Micronesia, Indonesia, those places are a long ways from over there. Okay, so, but South there's, Asia. There's another, I'm, I'm picking on you for another fucking reason, though, right? Because I just made a comment about the unknowns, right? So... There's another place in Asia where allegedly a ton of heroin comes from, but that's again not Southeast Asia, not South Asia. It's Central Asia, straight. I mean, it's fucking Afghanistan, right? I was gonna mention Afghanistan, okay, so, so, but, but that's but what I'm. I just we got to be more careful about what we pass off as like I I, I no this yeah. this is not knowledge. Uh -huh. I just know that 
globally, yeah. a large amount of heroin is manufactured in that golden triangle in South Asia. Um, I know Afghanistan makes a lot of heroin also, but hold hold that thought. The thought is being... talk, talk for a minute. Okay, and... so part of what it is that we're getting into here is these activities and the way that they're functioning uh, on and across borders, like in these spaces, where like you might have a situation where you have like, a, say you have a cartel that's functioning out of Mexico, for instance. Um, Chapo wasn't going to make a lot of trips up to the United States to conduct activities. He might have had lieutenants that were functioning in the United States. He certainly had foot soldiers that were functioning in the United States, mules, as it were. But they were people who uh, they had to dodge a lot of proverbial bullets and little bull literal bullets to get to where they would get to deeper and deeper into those inner circles. But when you have transnational uh, acts, I mean, like this, the second they could get Chapo, they they pulled him and they pulled him down to um, down to Supermax. Then what happened to his son? What a month, six weeks ago, whatever that was, um, he finally got caught by somebody inside of the. The ranks of the Mexican police that did not just release him back, and then he ended up here, right? Isn't that kind of so? Go ahead. Wait. Sorry, I, I I don't know exactly what happened, how uh -huh. he was arrested. I know that that we basically, you know, said "fuck you," you're not going to a Mexican jail, and and we put him in supermax, yeah, uh -huh. because supposedly we didn't want him running his organization from Mexico. It was what we. Probably, maybe not so correctly believed that he would not have the same access or reach. Right. But, I mean, when you have that much money and you can put that much fear into people. I mean, especially after still there. Yeah. after some of what the shit. Because, I mean, I talked to a security guard who worked for the prison system. And he said, fuck no, I am not ever going down there. He said, Chapo's down there, among others. But he said, there's no way I'm going down there. Because what if I fuck up? Yeah, what if I do something day. he doesn't like? Yeah. I mean, then my kid's going to be hung upside down from a bridge with his fucking skin pulled off or whatever. Okay. I understand where he's coming from. Um, there, I told you about that, that kid from Southern California that I worked with. The leg. They, 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 in Juarez, they cut this guy's, this, this, I mean, you could, you could say it's a boogeyman thing, but these things happened. It was very weird, very weird time period. The, and some of that shit for a while, when YouTube first came out, you could pull up the fucking videos on some of this nasty ass shit, but they cut this dude's leg off and he passed out. And then when he woke back up, they beat him to death with his leg. <laughs> Fucked up, dude. Dude, I always don't want to piss those guys said off. that I was going to do shit like that, like I was going to beat somebody to death with their own arm, but I didn't know somebody actually had done it. Well, they're, they, they're creative down there. So know. this is fucking rad, dude. Maybe they had him kick his own ass. I just looked up manufacturing heroin, and I think I put the country in the search. I don't know for sure. but So the UN has a drug policy thing. I pulled up this report thinking it would show me all of the places where heroin was being manufactured. And Afghanistan was the first one. And it showed, and I know I changed the subject on you. And I no, apologize. no, no, that was what we were trying to, we were, we, I was killing time while we were trying to get back to this point, motherfucker. So principal areas of opium cultivation in Afghanistan are Badakistan, no, Badakashan, Nangahar and Nelmond you're, or Helmond, you're, 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 whatever. Your Afghani is just—it's shit. I know. Not Belisimo. Here's here's the really good thing though. On the same report, they actually show you how to make heroin. It's fucking awesome, dude. Like serious. <laughs> it shows you a flow chart and all the ingredients that you need. <laughs> You gotta kind of wonder, like, in 1947 or 48 or wherever it was when they did the UN Charter, if if the people who were putting that together, you know, was Truman, he's still the president of that one. We're about to Eisenhower in that moment, but uh, they're like, 
maybe we should do a how to make heroin flowchart, you know? Dude, it's fucking sweet. And it in table two, it says chemicals used to make white heroin hydrochloride from 70 kilograms of raw opium. And it says you need uh, 0.1 kilograms of calcium oxide. You need 0.29 kilograms of ammonium chloride. I mean, it gives you a fucking ingredient list, dude. Does it? Does it? How much water? But it, it doesn't like actually give you the uh, the the step by step. So you, then you put in this one, and you got to bring the temperature up to 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And blah 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 blah. It doesn't give you that. Oh, I don't know. No, it doesn't say that. A UN report that, you know, that Walter White's heroin for you. Um, but so on the list, it had a list of, it did it or did it not have a list of who the biggest? Not on this report. This is just about Afghanistan. You apparently. and your fucking tangents, motherfucker. Get back to the heroin report, bitch. <laughs> um, I was on the heroin report. I just, I thought it was about all heroin, and then it fucking showed me how to manufacture so it. So it kept... by, is it breaking it down by nation state or no? That's... No, no. Um, I know if I kept digging uh -huh. around on the United Nations office on drug and crime, I could find something. But the Golden Triangle, I know they manufacture a shitload of heroin. Now, maybe, because lately they've been manufacturing a lot of meth, and they said that they sell a lot of it to Thailand and China. So... Maybe the majority of that stuff is just staying there, and our heroin is coming from Afghanistan and Mexico. This, but this is my whole fucking point, is, is that when we get to the point where, so you, you say, so the market is functioning this way, but then there's this other demand, so it shifts over here. So maybe this, and maybe that, and maybe that. And that's where things just get so fucking... No, I'm, I'm not saying I have the answers, but that's why I brought up Asia in general, because I know that they're... They manufacture drugs. I know that there are whatever you want to call them, not cartels necessarily, but there are large yes. multinational drug trafficking groups organizations. Of, groups of three or five or more people. Right. That are shipping drugs somewhere. Now, you know, maybe because of where they're located and the money that can be made, maybe... Australia is their main fucking market. So many maybes. Again, so many maybes. huge fucking maybe. But, I mean, because of the size of Asia and what they can cultivate and pump out, manufacture, whatever you want to call it, I don't think that we can discount them from this. But nobody, again, nobody ever says, well, there's this huge... I never, Hong I Kong even, triad, I, I or was not ever discounting. I just, Yakuza, I'm just, or whatever. I just, I just don't want to make a quick right turn assumption and then just do, start deducing things from that over and over and over again. I think, think that's where. I mean, we we can talk about the structures of them. Like part of the reason, like when I shipped that thing to you about uh, what the cartels were doing with regards to like the pharmacy is at the borders and stuff like that, and the way that like people were taking these. Uh, uh, drugs that were allegedly looking like drugs over the border and then selling them at like little weird markets like in san diego you know little little weird mexican markets in san diego where you can go in and buy like a a, a bar of a, a xanax right and uh you pay five bucks for it and then you take it and you put it on uh this little tester to see uh how much of the active ingredient that affects you to make you lethargic, the, the benzodi benzodiazepine pin inside of inside of the drug. So he, he like the guy when he shows us these these uh, uh, black market manufactured drugs of this example of Xanax. It's so like if you're looking at somebody who's like having a fucking heart attack and they got all the weird rhythms like. There's like a like the little up and down, up and down, up and down. But then there's this huge fucking spike, and he goes, "You see that huge spike right there? You should never be able to go and uh, test a little piece of Xanax and see that much active ingredient in it." And there are some really con big concerns about like where that where that can lead to. Um, but uh, this is something that we can point to, like so. 
you can see those markets functioning down there. You can see the guys riding around on their motorcycles. You can see, so like when she's going through the market with her camera and the people kind of start closing in on her basically saying, if you keep filming in here, if you're, you're trying to upset the uh, the secrecy that we're trying to yeah, embody they kind in of space, chased them off. then we're going to fucking kill you, right? And she does the multiple, <clears throat> and, and again, like, how we construct knowledge in relation to these spaces is very precarious. So what she does is she goes and she she fakes their voice. You know, she does the weird spin on their voices, protects their faces, and asks them all these various different questions. Questions. The first one, you find out that uh, the fentanyl thing, that you go down and you buy this um, little white pill that they're calling a 30-gram oxycodone, right? And she tests the pill. The, the, the gal that does the... Uh, um, uh, does all the research and all the interviews here. Her father is a pharmacist, pharmacist, so she's familiar uh, with the the industry growing up around her dad. Um, but uh, she she takes this little test kit and she tests the this alleged thirty uh, milligram mil, thirty milligram oxycodone, and it tests positive for fentanyl. Right. So uh, what ultimately is happening, or what it is she, that she posits, and it like you can go to these pharmacies on the border and you can buy these things and you don't have to believe what we're saying these are testable things though both literally and figuratively like because she literally takes them and tests them yeah you like they literally call it like a like a pharmaceutical disneyland you know but i mean ultimately you're not going down there to get most of the people that are going down there are going down there to buy these oxycodones that are for all intents and purposes really something a lot heavier and heavier than heroin at that well point in and that market in la uh -huh. You know, when she bought that fucking Xanax, uh, the lady warned her. She said, "It's from really Mexico." Yeah, yeah, she she said she said it to me like five times. It's from Mexico. <laughs> it's from Mexico. It's really potent. Don't eat it all at the same time. It's almost like she's like, if this little girl goes and eats this five dollar fucking pill, she's gonna die, and somebody's gonna come looking for me. You know. But having said that, I don't want to short sight everything that was happening there because it wasn't just, you know, illicit controlled substances. It was this guy, he went and bought uh, migraine medication that was down there. And she said, aren't you concerned that you're getting something that's not good? He says, he says, okay, so basically this is my situation. I have to go to the doctor first with my insurance, and it's a $95 copay to see a specialist. It's going to allow me to, to get the... Um, the prescription in the first place. He's got shitty insurance. He does have shitty insurance. but And he says, and that's $150 copay or something like that for, for, the, the, drugs. for the drug itself, right? So $245 bucks to go and get this prescription that he can go to the border and pay $30 for one. And like he said, she, she said, aren't you concerned? He says, it's effective. You know, so it's, it's again, it's an outcome-oriented kind of thing. But no matter whether it's an outcome-oriented thing, He's still running a risk. These are not things that are being tested. These are things, you know, something could get switched. You could end up with something. They could put a lethal dose in it. They could end up fucking killing you. So ultimately, you have one of the things that she was trying to highlight in this instance is through these markets that are being constructed in these spaces. First of all, you need to understand how the markets are being constructed in the first place. And she points out two really, really important thing, things. One is that uh, you can go south of the border and you can get these drugs without having to go to a doctor, without having to, having to have a prescription written out for you. You just go up to the pharmacia, you go to the tech, you give them the money, tell them what it is that you want, and you walk away and you have it. So there's there's that pro there's that the the the, the access to illicit drugs market uh, part of it. But the other part of it is that the U.S. healthcare system sucks so fucking bad that people are having to go down to Mexico to do their it, it, they called it healthcare tourism, right? I mean, this is, you go down there and it's not just for like going to see the doctors. I have a good buddy who worked at the post office for me for a long time. And when she has to do dental work and she knows her dentist, she goes down, she goes down to, I don't think she goes to El Paso, but it's a, it's a, it's a border city like that. And she goes across and you go into this fucking place and uh, like they, they make you, you know, loopy so that you can get your shit done. But they got, like, fucking TVs up on the fucking wall where you can change the channel. You know, like, they, the whole point is to make it comfortable while you're doing it. It's like, again, like this sort of, like, me medical, dental, healthcare, tourist position that, that they develop out of it. And she says, 
she she told me that so like if you go and you had she she had to get a bridge I think last time so there were two crowns that were involved in it and the bridge it, it was like seven thousand dollars or eight thousand dollars a dollar work in the United States for her to go down there and do it uh, three hundred dollars stay, stay down go down there fly down there stay down there in and out she's down there for three days her and her husband it's it's two thousand dollars and they're having fun you know so I mean this is the you know and she got. You know, she still got five dimes in her pocket because she didn't have to fucking waste them in a fight. And she had health insurance. She had dental insurance. But as bad as fucking our health insurance is up here, dental insurance is straight like straight fifty percent to a ceiling. And then you gotta fucking eat fucking like financial shit for the rest of the fucking time. So, oh dude. Fucking dental. I mean, you know, the fucking quasi socialist bullshit that they passed the American Health Care Act that all the fucking stupid Republicans call Obamacare. I hate that motherfucker, first of all, but it, all it does is cover medical. Dental isn't in there at all. And most dental, when you get in at work, you know, whatever. They'll cover your cleaning twice per year for free. But if you've got to fucking get a filling or like you said, a bridge or any fucking major work, it sucks. When Rhonda lived, that, uh, that girl I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, when she lived down in Texas, she'd go over there all the time to get fucking dental and medical. I mean, because they lived in Kingsville, so then they'd just drive down to Brownsville and fucking hop the border. And You know, it's funny. Everybody always sucks the dick because of the uh, um, pre-existing conditions clause. That's something that should always have been there in the first place. The one the one group of people that didn't hate Obamacare was the insurance companies, that's for sure. You make it illegal not to have health insurance for huge huge swaths of the population. Huge. Yeah. I, everybody. I mean... No, I, unless you have some sort of technicality that allows you to opt, opt out for whatever reason. That's the only reason why I said not everybody. It's, right. it's almost everybody. It's but it, I everybody. mean... Fuck Obamacare and fuck the insurance companies. The, the entire thing was bullshit and it's optics. Oh, well, we're getting everybody covered. Fuck you. You didn't cover me. I tried to do that state thing when I got laid off and they wanted fucking more than Cobra, dude. My Cobra was outrageous. It was like fucking $900 a month. Yeah. But those cocksuckers wanted like 12 and I go to the doctor once a month. My prescriptions and everything cost me. I mean, Way less all said that. and done, yeah. I'm two fifty yeah. without insurance. Yeah. Uh -huh. So fuck you, insurance companies. Suck my dick. Um, we might be slightly off topic. No, we were, no because we were. I mean, we're talking about that due to direct the pharmaceuticals yeah, the pharmacies, in, in yeah, Mexico. That's, that's yeah, directly connects to, and because the cartels are running that. That market, which is incredible. I mean, it's fucking. You want to talk about a dynamic industry? If you want to make the world better, give them something better to frame with regards to these industries that because they, they can clearly manage them. You know. Well, that's what I don't understand. Okay, so they've got access to opium, uh -huh. and even if they're making synthetic fentanyl, uh -huh. it since it's synthetic, you should be able to fucking move the strength up or down or know what kind of fucking dosage you're putting in the pill. So why are you ODing people? I, and maybe that's purpose on purpose. Or maybe they just don't. It's a, it's all about getting it, get in, get in, get in, get out quick. And these are the consequences of the actions. And in the United States, you know, you see what it is that's happening to these people, but we aren't we aren't demanding anything. We aren't in the streets crying about. And there have been some horrible situations. I, I told you I had like multiple friends who not they weren't their kids, but their 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 kids' friends. Like there was this one girl. She's twenty two years old. Uh, she was riding the the light rail back from being in a rave, and they pulled into the end, and she was she was dead. You know, there, and there was no bringing her it's back. She thought she was getting Molly, right? Yeah, she had. A, yeah, she took MDMA that was cut with fentanyl, and it and, and it fucking killed her. But like, we are not creating a uh, a political 
our social or political environment that's demanding consequences. So why would they give a fuck? They don't. There's. They're still making their fucking money, so they're going to keep doing what they're doing. Okay. So again, I I just want to jump back. Okay. Because so it says that most gangs are making their money off of robbery, drug and gun trafficking, prostitution, human trafficking, human trafficking and fraud. Yeah. Well, human trafficking, I think for the most part, would go away if we legalize prostitution. Well, they're talking about two different types of trafficking there, though. They're not just talking about trafficking for sex. They're talking about moving people, undocumented people across borders. Um, yes, they are. Maybe. Talking, yes, it is part but of that. But most of the yes. human trafficking that they're fucking scared of, at least based on the videos I've watched, are the ones, like I saw this one fucking movie, and... Dude kicks down a door, and it's this shitty, like an old gas station or something. And they're going through, and they're like, this is a fucking cartel joint. And there were just, like, sheets set up and maybe some wooden walls and fucking mattresses thrown on the floor. And they're like, girls would come in here. Yeah, yeah. Course, I'm, not, I'm definitely not, not saying sex trafficking. It's not a, I'm just saying that there's, there's another component. That's all I'm saying. So. Yeah. So maybe coyotes are part of it, but I think that a lot of that, I mean, we let those guys over because they're cheap. So, but whatever. Well, you can't be a pimp and a prostitute too. Um, so, <laughs> anyway. Um, Can you not graduate? From where? From being a prostitute to becoming a pimp. Yeah, but you or can't a be both. Well, no, that was just that line from one of the fucking White Stripes songs when he was talking about whatever. Anyway, um, so human trafficking, regardless, maybe. So that's what they do. Yeah. That's what they do. All so. Things. Well, and they do other shit. There's cyber so, crime and your point was that home prim- invasions and all of this. Primarily, that's what they're doing. That's what so again, if we if we legalize drugs. And these are the things that gangs are doing. If we legalize drugs, we legalize prostitution. What else was there on there? I mean, if we legalize a lot of this shit, then we take power out of their hands. Now, maybe they still sell drugs or sell guns to somebody else or, you know, maybe now. I don't think home invasions are burglaries. They start doing home invasions more because they're not making any money off of prostitution or drugs. But. I, I don't know. I don't think that that would necessarily happen. Um, I think that that's one of those fear tactics that our government uses against us. But I think that, and, and maybe there would still be black market prostitution. I don't know. But I know that if we legalize drugs, we take a large percentage of the shit off the table. Yeah, well, I mean... Yeah, yeah, and we 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 clearly agree that. Uh, but I mean, at some point, like, so that you don't get all the fucking people that are trying to make this move killed. Because honestly, like, if you literally just try to eliminate that market overnight, there are going to be some consequences for the people that are effectively trying to do that. I don't think that Chapo's people are just going to take that line down. No, but that's. I mean, like when we were talking about it, I think that that's something that's negotiable because now he's at least in the eyes of whichever government he's dealing with. Cause you know, we could probably get Mexico to say yes to since the reason they started cracking down on it was because of us. Um, now he's a legal businessman. So maybe we give him a cut. Well, that, so that, that, I mean, that was where I was going is yeah. that you have to incorporate these people. And the fact of the matter is whether you like it or not, they're, they've demonstrated an, an extremely powerful capability to coordinate activity. So you just have to redirect their energies towards something that's more socially. And we uh, have to make sure that they're not doing weird shit with the fentanyl and cutting it into oxy or, well, you know, but whatever. If you, if you, I mean, that's, but if you open up that space, then something that is being done in a covert way is no longer being done in a covert right. way. So we, we, that, that means that like, uh, it's like the scene in, uh, the, you know, the sum of all fears with the, with the nuclear, like they go, they go into the nuclear arsenal, and then all of a sudden it's like all above board. And Morgan Freeman says, "I, uh, you know, I, I, I sent five people in here to to get in here, and they all died trying to get in here." You know, I mean, it's it 
goes this way forever and then it flips into this totally fucking different different thing where all these people that were working to make bombs are existing to decommission them and then just study those kinds of things while they're doing it so that you understand what it is that you've been fucking around with for the last 70 years or so or 80 years well and i think because i mean the majority of the violence that's going on in a city like chicago that's drug related shit um you know it's people fighting over turf it's people stealing other people's drugs whatever i mean people are getting shot because of drugs and chicago is not the only city that that's happening so i'm not saying gangs would go away because there have always been gangs um forever yeah they've, they've been here for can i can i tell the the, the taiwan story yeah no? okay so uh, when I was going through these books, the one that was talking about the the Chinatown, it was the Chinatown book. Um, there was a study that was done through uh, Southern California, Southern California University. I can't remember what it was. I'm not even sure they actually even said what it was when I was listening to it. But uh, um, they did uh, interviews with gang members, and they were they were looking at them through a specific ethnic lens because they were trying to see whether or not there were distinctions about what had motivated their activities in joining the gangs. Uh, about the activity that they maintained and like how they continued to relate to it as time time wore on. Um, and there's kind of an important point in this in relation to one of the things that Brian said where leaving a leaving a gang is a death sentence. And uh, in this instance, it was not. So they focused on two groups. It was males, um, uh, Chinese males, ethnically Chinese males, and uh latin american males so whether they from they were from you know mexico central america or south america proper didn't matter the lineage just had to your lineage just had to come from that that location so with the uh asian males they found a very peculiar distinct group inside of it where there were these uh taiwanese individuals that were part of these taiwanese gangs and these kids were so like one of the things like that we keep sort of echoing over and over again and it was definitely true with with the with with the uh the latinos or chicanos or however the individuals identified themselves um they they joined the gangs because they did not have economic opportunities and the gangs provided them with uh ways to make money to provide themselves to provide for their families and so on and so forth uh all of a ton of these Taiwanese kids, um, they were middle class kids, and they were doing everything that Brian said when he ran down the list. You know, there was extortion, there was uh, drug, you know, drug drug trafficking, uh, human trafficking, uh, home invasion. You know, all these weird burglaries. You know, robbery, like, carjacking, yeah, carjacking. But it was all it was all small time kind of stuff. But um, so when they went through the information that they got in these uh interviews that they did as i was listening to them, there's this there's this uh article it, it, that if you have a degree in sociology they always make you read it's called the strength of weak ties i think is what it is but uh um the way that these taiwanese kids were sort of like playing out their drug or their gang activity was sort of like networking like if you if you could imagine it like that and in the book there were like a a ton of these individuals had ties to um, strong corporate positions both inside the United States and inside of Taiwan through their parents. And one of them's parents, parent was actually a, a, a cabinet member for, for Taiwan. So like the function and the form with which they were um, associating to the concept of gang life was not so much, like I said, like a, uh, like a bandit, you know, not like a Robin Hood kind of concept where like you're reappropriating a position to where you, you can have a good life and your family can have a good life. It was about something different. It was, it looked a lot more like, you know, when I imagine like uh, the ways in which uh, the East Indian Trading Company was functioning in relation to pirates back then, you know, like if you know how to do these activities, these cutthroat activities and to be out on the sea with these weapons at your disposal and to be able to sort of like uh, neutralize adversaries, extract uh, 
value from these spaces, however it is that you need to do to do that. And the people who had been doing that professionally for a long time in the form of pirates uh, basically just got their asses handed to them because they did not have the uh, uh, the capabilities. Like, what what did the East Indian, Tra Indian Trading Company have, have behind it? So, like, if you imagine, like, say, like, at the beginning, they they because it was the first share corporation in the history of the universe. They were, I mean, if you think about it, because you called them pirates, yeah. which I think is a good analogy. Uh -huh. But essentially, they were black water. They're, they're the fucking, first. They're mercs. Yes, they were. That's exactly what they were. So, so in this moment, yeah, they had the capability of going up, fucking everybody up. They had all the gold in the world behind them because the people that were funding the operations that that they were doing were were the the upper echelon in uh, London society during that time period, and it was the crown. So the crown was backing them. All the fucking money in the in the richest parts of fucking England was backing them, and and they had the military capabilities to go to these places and do whatever the fuck they wanted to do. So Brian well, said Blackwater. Yeah, Boom. it was it was just the royalty, right? Because it was all the fucking lords and dukes yeah, yeah, and yes. whatever those fucking uppity. You're tied to the land. Yeah. yeah. The, the the what do you call them? the uh, um the monarchy? Not, well, the monarchy is the the actual people that are inside of it, but the. Uh, like you said, the the duke, not just the dukes and the duchesses. The uh, um, if you're part of the landed class, that you you own land, you have people on your land. Um, I, I can't think of the word. As soon as we start talking about something else, it'll come into my head immediately. But the point is, is though that when I look at the way that these Taiwanese kids were starting to identify themselves, um, it looks a lot more like uh, the next chapter of corporations in a world where you have uh, production positions that functions on a function on a transnational level. You have people that function in power spaces that function through nation states, but are effectively existing above them in many respects. This is the East Indian Trading Company on fucking like methamphetamines and steroids. I mean, they can do Literally. whatever the fuck they want. So these kids that see that in and they were in these they were in three cities in in LA County um they were understanding exactly what uh how power was functioning in today that the, the democracy no longer exists properly and there's something else that's uh allowing for power to reproduce itself well i think that a lot of these gangs are starting to understand that and they're not just being thugs anymore and you know they're not identifying themselves and they're kind of backed off in the shadows but they're starting to i don't know like nobility shake the hands nobility was the word i was looking for i'm just an idiot sorry no that's shake fine hands, yeah. they're they're starting to shake the hands and and try to get to know these larger gangs or or organized crime syndicates but they're also going the other way and they're saying, okay, well, you know, maybe if I buy this, whatever, convenience store, or I buy this, whatever it is, because like I've got, I've got $10,000. So I'm going to buy a liquor store. And I know that a liquor store costs more than 10 grand, but now I can start to launder my money through whatever. Yeah. And but I'm doing legitimate things with this other illegitimate stuff. Right. And so they're starting to understand the way that money actually moves and that they need these larger guys over here to help them with either drug supply or legal connections or whatever. Right. Uh -huh. So they start to do both. And then they end up, I mean, I know you said you've never seen the movie, but in Johnny Mnemonic, one of the largest corporations in the world is run by the Yakuza and they don't even fuck around and pretend like it's not the Yakuza. And I think we're coming dangerously close to something along those lines. I mean, I was fucking, well, you and I were talking about Vegas. So the mob used to run Vegas. The mob is still in Vegas, but now it's run by corporations. 
But, well, I mean, aside from them beating the fuck out of people that are cheating, I don't see a whole lot of difference. I think they're probably ripping people off more than the mob ever did. But I think that that could easily be changed if, like, one of these Taiwanese kids gets a job as a VP and gets promoted up through because, you know, he graduated from Stanford with fucking honors or whatever. You know what I mean? So if you've got gang ties and now all of a sudden you're in this corporate position, what's going to stop you from just running it down to the streets? You know, it's, it's odd how when Trump was president, like people were using the the word they were throwing around the word fascist. I don't know, like they were popping bubbles and bubble gum or some shit like that. But when I see these kinds of things, like you know, where there is so much corruption in these spaces, and where you have these pe- the corporations are being these social spaces, you know where. Uh, individuals that were once doing this are being slotted into formal spaces like that it's not a new thing i mean for fuck's sake you know uh, george w bush you know his dad was the head of the cia he became the vice president and he got caught fucking doing partying and doing coke and causing trouble so they fucking send him off to go be in the reserves go pay to get blowjobs in the philippines or something like that you know i mean this it's all the same fucking day you know i mean but at the same time uh looking and listening to Donald Trump talking about grabbing people's fucking pussies and thinking that that's the the hardest aspect of what's really going on in front of us, of us is kind of embarrassing. We've been looking, staring down the barrel of prisons and fucking drugs and fucking now gangs for the last, you know, three weeks. Well, longer than that. I, I mean, mean... But, I mean, just for, 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 these, for these fine folks. Well, you know. because we haven't even talked... And I kind of said, you know, they recruit one guy and he's wearing blue and then all of a sudden he's wearing green. The military is probably the largest fucking gang ever. I mean, unless you consider individual police forces gangs or all of them together, and then they're probably tied. But... The police don't go from high school to high school trying to recruit. The fucking military does. I mean, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, they're all fucking there in force. And they're trying to recruit the same way that these gangs do. They find the kid that has this fucking isolation complex, this fucking low self-esteem, some kid that's just completely... Not completely mental, but like I said, isolated and can be easily manipulated if you create yeah. a space to where they have some sort of like a sense of belonging, family, something that would uh, be absent in the the social space that they're existing in when the recruiter finds them. And that's exactly the way the gangs recruit these kids, and the military does the same fucking thing. Okay. You so you 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 do an eight year career in the military and you did uh, ranger school right and then you did one other advanced you know like uh, you didn't go into like military intelligence or anything like that but you had some special training right you, you're out after that and one of your buddies had been you know he he went he went with uh, this organization called professional Mil- professional military resources incorporated to go over and train. Uh, Nigerian troops uh, who are working with the African Union military. And they right? paid them like twenty five thousand dollars a month or something. Well, so at the beginning, at the beginning, they're only paying them. They're they're paying them. They're paying them six. But something breaks out in in, in South Sudan, so we're gonna give you we're gonna give you sixteen a month to go into this combat zone and to protect this pipeline, you know. And ain't nobody gonna see anything that happens there. So. Uh, somebody comes across, you know, you 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 pop a cap in their ass, you 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 do some other weird shit, you know. I mean, it just looks. Your point, it just looks an awful lot like uh, becoming a lieutenant in in a gang, you know, like being one of Chapo's lieutenants, where you're going up higher, you're get your 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 risk is higher, uh, your commitment to the overall system is higher. They know you're not going to roll over on them. They know that you're going to stick with them. That you've bought into the. Uh, the reason why it is that you're there, 
So you're going to shut up. You're going to make your, you know, $240,000 a year. You're going to buy yourself a, you know, a $1.1 million house right outside of Boston, you know, and uh, you're going to go out and do this. You're going to have your two kids at home. You're going to have your fucking dog. And then you might get recruited for the CIA. I mean, there are lots of things that could happen from there. But or you're maybe that, you're just a consultant for the consult, CIA. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of that shit going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and then at that point, you are just a lieutenant, and you're calling shots, and you're doing other shit. Maybe you're blowing up, not the pipeline. Well, maybe you are blowing up the pipeline if it was. Well, that was the Nord Stream pipeline, right? Yeah, so the Nord Stream too. I mean, how so did, how did you even say that, Biden? You've got to be the dumbest fucker on the planet to say what you said there. We, uh, and, and whether or not you call the military gang, and I know some of our listeners may have been in the military or may know people in the military, but you know, before you get all offended, really think about what you did, why you did it, and who you know. And why they did it. Because I'm not entirely wrong. I mean, I know that some kids go in and volunteer because they got a fucking 1600 on the SATs. And they're going to go in and do all of this great shit at the fucking Air Force Academy. And then, you know, be wherever. But for the most part, that isn't the case. I mean, again, if we're talking about the bell curve, then... The majority of people are not up here at the bell. <laughs> and I, I, it was Nord Stream one. I'm sorry. They were halfway finished with Nord Stream two, and we 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 blew up one and sabotaged two well enough to, to know that uh, that Germany and the rest of uh, Western Europe will not be benefiting from inexpensive natural gas from Russia anytime soon. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> so we've got a lot of gangs. And obviously, we can't get rid of all of them, and we can't get rid of crime. There's just no way. And if a gang really is three or more people, juvenile, delinquent, hoodlum, or criminal, then there isn't a fucking thing we can do about it, especially with the way things are going right now. I mean, it seems like when I drive down, it doesn't matter which fucking road I choose, really, whether it's Broadway or Colfax or fucking Wadsworth, it seems like more and more homeless are there. Um, and if there are more homeless, there are more people that are destitute. And if there are more people that are destitute, there are more people that are going to break the law in order to do what it is they need Just to do. To survive. Whether Just it's to, to eat or find a fucking roof. Yeah, just to whatever, survive, just to survive, right? right. Um, so we we really need to look at some shit, and instead of being scared of gangs, actually look at why it is gangs exist. Now, again, part of it might be financial, but that definition is you're such a delinquent. Protection and profit. So profit is part of it, but protection's the other. So maybe, eh, well, fuck, I don't know. Yeah, I, I was, I am a delinquent. I'm just not juvenile anymore. Well, well was, yeah, 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 it's good. I'm glad, to, I'm glad that you at least, like, not only rescinded really that, just, like, at least on the level to where you understand that some of the shit that comes flying out of your mouth can occasionally, like... Just graze up against juvenile. Yes, I'm not juvenile in age. Yeah. Juvenile in action. Indeed. Yeah, that was more concise than what I was trying to... Yeah. That I was failing at, yes. So, I mean... And again, all of these things connect in one way or the other. I mean, if you go all the way back to the first episode of Roe v. Wade, everything has a needle on a thread running all the way through it. I mean, with the exception of maybe Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and fucking guitar players and, and some of the stuff we did like that, but... We all... need to devote a little bit more time to guitar players at some point. And we got to do I think so. more, the 45-minute thing is over. We can't do 45 minutes. 
I also think we should do well vocalists, but female vocalists specifically. Um, before we get too far off, though, um, we did kind of like spin out into that uh, the military or the uh, uh, military state actors or private actors who function in a military capacity on behalf of uh, corporations or the state. To the we we we. We probably need to develop that argument, uh, them as a gang, a little bit more clearly, and I'm sure we can find that. But that was, we, we plugged a lot of stuff in there in about 15 minutes that I think that maybe a month or two down the road, we could probably get a full episode of like, take that Kodak moment of gangs and make it clear how it is that we're really understanding that in the context of military activities and capacities and private military and mercenaries and uh, well, so, well, yeah, we can always talk about yeah. it later. But, I mean, specifically, I was just talking about their recruitment process. Yeah, that's, a, that's how we segued into it. But we started going off on a bunch of different... Uh, yeah. But but th that's why I just think, like, I just don't want anybody to... Because there's an argument there. We just need to make it clear. Well, so here's here's the thing. I mean, and again, I wasn't talking about private militaries as much, but I can see that also but so you're recruited out of high school so you're 17 years old about to turn 18 and you go in to whatever branch of the military because you were a fucking only child or whatever you're fucking bullies in the neighborhood beat you up all the time and you wanted to become a man maybe that's what your dad told you you need to become a man go to the army whatever so you go there, and, okay, so let's say you're in a street gang, and one of the neighboring gangs fucks with you, so you've just been jumped in, and you are now part of this gang. But they tell you, look, these guys have been fucking with us forever. You need to do two things. One, you need to make a name for yourself. And two, you need to show those motherfuckers who we are. So we want you to take out one of them. It doesn't matter which one. Anyone at all. So they give you a gun and they tell you to go do it. And you go and shoot somebody. Maybe you get caught, maybe you don't. That's irrelevant. Same thing happens in the fucking military. Regardless of whether or not you believe in what it is you're doing, you're going to fucking do it. I mean, you know, I know what you're saying. Here. I know you I do. Want, just I'm want, just talking we gotta, to the mic. They get that. They get that. We, but we need to develop. I I, 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 okay. But I think that we need to develop the concept of like how that applies writ large because it's not just doing something as a foot soldier, it's constructing. A, a, a situation that reproduces itself over and over and over again and how that plays into all those different levels because that's how you understand how it is that we keep doing this shit you know just the okay. psychology the, well, the, we, the, the we psych can talk about it later yeah. but I mean essentially well that's that's fine um okay so we're coming up on an hour now and most of our episodes recently have been like an hour 20. So do we have anything else past the military that we want to talk about? I don't have anything. No? I'm fried. Are you? Yeah. But I can talk. I mean, I can always talk even when I'm fried. So. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know for sure, I mean, where we want to go with it. I think on the next episode we're talking about gang movies, which there are a bunch of them. I still wish I would have watched the movie. I need to watch that. You should. It's a great fucking flick, dude. Um, but again, it's it's almost identical to Blood In, Blood Out. Yeah, but I would have just because sometimes when you when you have the frame coming at a certain time and the frame coming, I would have liked it. You know, because it gets sometimes it gets romanticized more in certain spaces. You know, it, I just want to see it. Well, and when they tossed him off the third tier in American Me, it was different than when they killed him in Blood In, Blood Out. Because they actually showed him, like, flying. 
It's oh. too bad you guys missed. Brian's acting skills are incredible sometimes. Well, I'm a method actor. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about gang movies, which I don't know if it'll have more substance, but we'll be able to talk a hell of a lot more. I I don't know. Again, this is one of those topics you can't really cover in in two hours. I mean, when I did that sociology project back in whatever the fuck it was, 93, maybe, um, I had an hour to do it, and I covered, like, different tags and gangs around Denver and, you know, I talked to the city attorney and went to this fucking gang meeting called GRASP. What, what was that? It was, I can't remember what the fucking acronym stands for, but it was G R. Is it members or is it? Well, it was gang members that were trying to get out of the gang. Um, so obviously people have left gangs without getting killed. But I'm guessing that they weren't very high up and they never witnessed anything real bad. Yeah, because once you get... Yeah, yeah, you, you... I mean, if somebody knows that you know that so-and-so murdered somebody or you saw so-and-so murder somebody or you were there, whatever, um, so I don't, I don't think casino, you're getting out. The casino scene, you know. Why, why, why take the risk? Again, they Joe know. Pesci was just nuts, though. He was, but they they still fucking just... Because you can't kill everybody. But if they know, if they have the goods... There are some people that deserve to be killed. Sammy the Bull Gravano should be dead. I don't know why he's not, especially since he climbed out of witness protection and then ended up getting busted selling fucking Molly down in fucking Phoenix. Um, the mob should have gone and killed him. Well, if they didn't do it, they had their reasons. I guess maybe he started paying the tax on all of the fucking molly he was selling. I don't know. Because I've heard of that, too, where you can buy your way out of your contract. Which is fucking weird, dude. And that goes against, like... The family contract. Maybe I have too much weird, like, loyalty and honor <laughs> shit in my head to even comprehend any of this shit because if you break the oath we put out a contract and then you say oh well I'll give you $250,000 or 2 million or whatever it is yeah. for you not to kill me it doesn't make any fucking sense now it's probably at that point in time you should probably just take the 2 million and then kill it anyway but that's shady, too. That breaks the loyalty and honor thing. I don't I don't know, dude. Sometimes that, that would send a message, I think, pretty clearly. You think you can buy your way out of it? We'll let you think you think you can buy your way out of it. So then you give me the money, and then there's no buying your way out of it. I couldn't do that. I'd rather just kill him and rob him. Because then... You're going to just take his pinky ring off and take yeah, his watch. Take his and... watch. <laughs> slit his throat. Jamma's fucking nuts in his mouth. Why did they put the coins over people's eyes back in the days? Those are the river sticks, dude. It, oh, because it pays the... Ferryman. They'll pay the ferryman until he gets you to the other side. Right, but apparently the Irish and the Italians don't do that. Or the Catholics, I should say. But I've never seen Mexicans put pennies over somebody's eye. They Not that it. I've actually seen it. They did it in uh, uh, Game of Thrones with the stones. Yeah, but those were weird stones with the fucking eyes drawn well, on them. What so was that? What was that all about? Then did they ever? Because that to was make it look there. like they were alive, I thought. Oh, so it's sort of like oh, omnipotent kind of because like, you'd only put them on royalty or because it was always the uh, they put it on uh, Robert Baratheon yeah. and then they put it on uh, Joffrey after he was king. And they always found those perfect oval rocks, dude. It's fucking weird. I wonder whose job that was. Come on, dude. I'm getting paid to go find some perfect oval rocks to put on that cockbag Joffrey's eyes. I always joked around about whose job it was to fucking 
carve those fucking stupid things that they put on the map when they were like, oh, well, he's got all of these troops here, and we've got these troops here. Like, who's the fucking guy? There's the not a you store. Get, you, carve, you, you carve the wolf. Right. Yeah. There's the not wolf. a store you could go to. So they've got these fucking deer heads over here. And... Rob's like sitting there, motherfucker, <laughs> I, need to, I need you to get a fucking move on with the fucking heads. <laughs> We can't fucking fight the war until you got them all out there. Bitch. You didn't carve enough of these motherfuckers. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I don't know. They never have fuck. a problem with that. Because they had so much scratch that they, they had, a, lot they had a, car, they had a carver on hand. But all of those guys had a lot of dough. Well, but they, and we even find that the Lannisters didn't really have a lot of dough. They owed a ton of money to the they fucking had, Iron Bank. Like, no dough. No dough? No dough. I had one of those ones. All right, boys and girls, I think we're coming to a fucking end because somehow we started talking about Game of Thrones. Um, And again, I changed the subject on you. My apologies, Darren. What are you? Fuck you, motherfucker. Um, I'm going to... When you're under the ground, and I'm, I'm going to play... Uh, um, uh, your son. I'm the man no, 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 in the box. Oh, you're talking about eulogy? eulogy? Yeah. yeah. He had a lot to say. He, he had, had a lot, lot of nothing, nothing to, to say. say. Well, that's him. Um, I'm not going to be in the ground, though. I'm getting roasted. You're going to get Roasted, burned? toasted. I was going to steal your coins. I don't even give a fuck if anybody sprinkles me. I mean, I'm dead, dude. I don't, I don't give a fuck if anybody sprinkles me. Right. You know what, Coz? We're gonna do. We're gonna take Brian's yearn, yarn, yearn, urn, urn. That's the word I was looking for. Yearn, urn. We're gonna take his urn, and we're gonna put it right at the edge of the uh, the backpack here, and you're gonna urinate on Brian. It doesn't ever burn up really like fine. Otherwise, I'd say you could just flush me down the toilet because like a goldfish. He says he doesn't want to be sprinkled. So I figured no, I said I don't even care if I'm sprinkled. I'm just going to let him get tinkled. Ah, sprinkled, tinkled. Um, all right, since uh, Cuddles is going to piss on me, we're done with this episode. <laughs> Malty's <Multi, laughs> Golden Shower. Shower <laughs> Short Bus Debate Club at Yahoo.com. 720-334-ROLL. We'll see you when uh, we do the, uh, the mob movies. All right. The gang movies. Gang movies. Talk to you later.